voting on in the next few weeks. Our mill levy is the lowest of all our neighboring districts, including Evergreen, Inner Canyon that services the Morrison area, Platte Canyon that services the Bailey area, and North Fork, which services the Pine area. Also, it's important to note our mill levy has not increased since 1972. That's 41 years. Community's grown a lot in that time. So before you go to vote, we as a small group of just citizens decided to come together and put this together so that we could all hear and find out why our fire department needs the money and what it would spend on. And for you to get an opportunity to ask questions and get your questions answered. So that when you go to vote, you can make a good, educated decision. So what's on our agenda for the next hour? You're going to first hear from Neil Whitehead, who's a resident of the community, who's going to basically come up here and show you a map of what is Elk Creek Fire, how far does it, um, you know, what's the range of our Elk Creek Fire District, and some of the fires that we have, and how large they are in size, and you're going to be amazed to see the size. You're then going to hear from County Commissioner Don Rozier, who is working on a slash um, pickup initiative, so he's going to tell you a little bit about that. We're then going to hear from Travis Griffin, who's going to talk about how important it is to have a quick initial attack on a fire if it happens again. We're then going to bring up Chief Bill, Bill Watson, who's actually going to tell you exactly how he intends to spend the money if it's approved by the voters. I'm going to talk briefly about the insurance issues that our homeowners up here are facing right now. And then last but not least, you're going to hear from Berkeley, who is a firefighter, and they're going to be putting on an open house at the station. So that basically is, is what we're going to do for the next hour. We're going to conclude in an hour. And those of you who feel like you've got enough information are free to get on with your evening. Those of you who are interested in staying for the question and answers will stay and answer the questions that you have. It's just important that if you, you should have gotten a card when you walked in, so make sure as you have questions throughout uh, the presentations, that you write those on, and then we'll be collecting them at the end of um, the hour. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up Neil Whitehead as the lights, I think, are coming back up. So, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> well, I'm a uh, geologist and the first thing that uh, comes to my mind when uh, I'm given a new problem or uh, a new area is to get a map find a map that shows what I need, and if uh, there is not a map available, well, then I'm going to uh, make one. <coughs> and this is uh, the two maps that I made. On the left is a uh, United States Geological Survey uh, total map. Actually, I've got about eight or nine uh, quadrangles or pieces of quadrangles that I've put together. And this is the Heyman Fire area, and the red outline is the perimeter of the fire, and this is the uh, Oak Creek Fire Protection District that's superposed upon that fire, and it's 215 square miles. And the uh, Oak Creek Fire Protection District is uh, 98 square miles, so it was more than twice as big as the Oak Creek Fire Protection District. Uh, on the right is a, uh, uh, this is actually six quadrangles put together, and uh, Aspen Park is about here. Richmond Hill Fire Station is here. Uh, this is uh, C-470 volts, and so this is a replacement series for these old standard photo maps, and this is a, uh, this is actually a photo image map which contains all the information on this map plus uh, actual photo image. Uh, this is an enlargement of the uh, previous map. Uh, it's the scale is one steeple with 2,000 feet, and this is a yardstick, and that comes out to 13.6 uh, miles. So that's sort of a, a rough scale, and this interval right here is one mile. And this is uh, holes in C-470, and this is the hallback, and over in this uh, point is the uh, uh, downtown Bailey, and this is Richmond Hill, and you know that this uh, boundary out here is based essentially on uh, the sections within the Township of Green Survey System. It's not at all related to topography or the present day development of the subdivisions and that produces the problems. So this is one of the key, and then the red outlines here 
are some of the uh, large fires that I'll briefly go over with. And uh, so I feel it's really quite important to know uh, something about where you are, where you live, and where the fires have been, and get a sense of geography, and that's how we can begin to understand part of the problem. And the dash lands represent other uh, fire protection districts to the north is uh, Evergreen, uh, to the west is Black Canyon, and on the uh, dis uh, Fair Play Dispatcher, they call this District 5. Uh, to the south, here's uh, Pine Grove or Pine, and this is North Fork. This area is uh, Inter Canyon, and I didn't really put in the boundary, but this would be West Metro boundary approximately over here. So uh, each of these uh, other fire districts are key and important because uh, each fire district renders what they call mutual aid when they need some help from somebody else. This sort of, this is a close-up of the previous map. Here's the uh, uh, outline of boundary of uh, the Elk Creek Fire Protection District. Uh, this is Station 4 uh, in Aspen Park. Uh, the Elk Creek Headquarters Station Number 1 in Richmond Hill. Uh, 3 at Austin uh, Mountain. And 2, uh, I'm not in this full bar, just a little bit from Nine Junction. And this is uh, 285, which runs through here. Uh, start out with uh, Elk Creek Station 1 is the uh, headquarters of uh, the Elk Creek Fire Protection District and uh, this is where the administrative offices are and for those of you that have just moved up into the mountains you can pr practically drive through uh, this now that they put in the new uh, revised part of 285 and not even know there's a fire station there. Uh, it's sort of the heart, uh, heart of the uh, protection district and uh, there are uh, two ambulances here, which are staffed by uh, six full-time employees, which they pull shifts. And so, at uh, any time you call 911, uh, that's where your ambulance is going to be dispatched out of. And there are uh, full-time there's a paramedic and a firefighter EMT on uh, duty there. Uh, this is Station Three, and that's up at uh, uh, Base and Timothy on Conifer Mountain, and uh, that. Primarily serves the Conifer Mountain area. The only way they can get out of here is through uh, essentially Kennedy Gulch or Christopher uh, Kennedy Gulch Drive out to 285, or else they can go what I call just sort of what I call the Labyrinth, which is like Kings Valley. <laughs> this is Elm Creek number four. Uh, West Jeff uh, Elementary School is here, West Jeff Middle School is here. That's King Supers. And then this is the uh, Mark and Ryan, so it's right across from the Mark and Ryan, another building, and uh, uh, it's Elk Creek 4. And this uh, is uh, Pine Junction, this is uh, Pine Valley Road, and then this is Mount Evans Boulevard, and this is Elk Creek Station number 2. And on this one you can see, it's pretty good enlargement of this uh, U.S. Coco map, which shows the photo image in some of the larger buildings, and then also, in this case, it's, uh, you can see the uh, topographic contours. And this is a later PDF, and these are available from the uh, website of the United States Geological Survey now. And you can download them. And by layer, it means you can turn on various layers. You can turn on the stream drainage, you can turn on the highways, the topography, and the uh, photo images, and sort of build your own map with the kind of information you want. And moving on to the uh, large fires, this is our overview map. Here's the uh, boundary of the Elk Creek Fire Protection District, the southern part. Uh, here's Elk Creek uh, Station Number One here. Uh, Pine Junction is located here. Uh, Pine, and actually on the government maps now they show it as Pine, Pine Grove, so it's officially Pine Grove according to the government now. And this is uh, Buffalo Creek, and uh, this is the North Fork of the South Pine River. And uh, so this is Buffalo Creek. And the, uh, I'll go into this in more detail, but this is the uh, Lower North Fork Fire, Lime Gulls Fire, Buffalo Creek Fire, and High Meadow Fire. And uh, again, this for scale, this is one mile. So this gives you the uh, burn perimeters of some of the major fires starting back in 1996. And kind of gives you the idea that we're pretty well bracketed to the south and actually onto the Oak Creek Fire Protection District 
with some uh, major fires. This is the uh, Order 1 Fort Fire, and the grid you can see on here is a 1,000 meter grid. And for you uh, guys who are in uh, Vietnam, that is uh, standard on Army maps, and I'm assuming it's in the same way in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, this fire, this is the lower North Fork of uh, South Platte, and this is uh, Kennedy Gulch, Foxton Road, which runs down here and joins. And in this direction, you would go to uh, um, um, forgot what it's going to uh, uphold. Right. And uh, so this was started by a control burn somewhere down in this area by the Colorado uh, Forest Service and moved uphill you know, very rapidly. And uh, three people were uh, killed, unfortunately, in, in this fire. This is six and a half square miles, and these isolated pieces here are the result of uh, spotting, where uh, uh, embers are blown out in advance of the main fire and start their own fire, and then these things can grow in March. And in terms of topography, you can't really see it, but this is a topographic high along, and this is a Custer, Custer Road, and it terminates out of here. And so it's one way in and one way out. When the fire came up like this, there were a number of people up in this area that basically got trapped and that they uh, had to uh, uh, move. They had a big problem moving out. And uh, just briefly, uh, this is the uh, uh, High Meadows Fire, and that's uh, 18 square miles. And uh, here's Pine Grove. And moving on, here's uh, Black Mountain Fire. Uh, this is the uh, this is actually the Jefferson County border right here. This is Park County and uh, the Creek Fire Protection District, which is part of Park County. And as, as the final uh, uh, two maps, this is the perimeter in red, dark red of the Haman Fire. The dotted line is the perimeter of the burn of June the 9th. And uh, the fire started down here on June the 8th. And at 7.30 in the morning, the fire front was here. And by 11 o'clock at night, the fire front was here. And this is a linear distance of 18 and a half uh, miles. And it burned just 18 and a half miles in 15 and a half hours. And so that was uh, about 94 square miles in one day, 91 day. And uh, we're only uh, 98 square miles. So that gives you an idea of the magnitude and the strength of some of these uh, forest fires. And I'll just skip over that. To summarize, uh, we face a continual threat of wildland fires. We're all in this boat together, and it's made of wood, tiny and square long boat. And that serves an important visually, visualization tool. And uh, it's up to you to be informed as voters to make the right decision about the level of service that you wish to receive from your uh, fire and emergency uh, medical personnel. And thank you very much.
I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about Forest Health and a Forest Health initiative that in listening to many of you throughout the three years that I've been County Commissioner and seeing the devastation that fire has caused, looking at the floods and what happens after fire and then if we get floods and heavy rain events, what does that do to our forest health and how that affects our um, water supply and looking at the overall impacts with the county and the devastation with our infrastructure that we all will end up paying to repair and to replace. So, uh, once, as the chief is doing this, I really busted the machine, didn't I? Um, also here with me today is uh, Brett Roller. Uh, Brett has uh, worked with me on putting together uh, an initiative here that I wanted to uh, present to you tonight uh, in a way to address uh, slash collection. Brett, you want to help there? <laughs> And uh, hopefully we'll get it in the morning. Sorry. Yeah, I can give you a picture of all this kind of computer work. I love it. I love it. Oh, there you go. No? All right. We are, I'm going to improvise, and uh, the proposal that I will make sure that it gets distributed to uh, the proposal, uh, I'll, put, I'll go ahead and uh, get it in electronic form and also uh, paper form for everybody. Is this. Having looking at forest health, uh, looking at our, our, our forest canopy, looking at what we have uh, right now among us, we have the infestation of the bark beetle. We have overgrowth and unhealthy forests in some locations. Um, doing, you know, not not proper forest maintenance and management as far as logging activities, other things that are not occurring and requiring or causing the uh, forest to become actually too dense and not healthy. And what is that doing? It's affecting our water supply, it's affecting us when it comes to fire and our fire danger. One of the main and primary items that we can do to try to prevent that is how do we properly maintain the, the property we have as far as residential lot owners. Also, what is the county doing in open space, dealing with also um, Denver Mountain Parks and making sure that they're maintaining their property to the utmost and to the best ability that they have. One way that we can, we can look at forest health and we can help mitigate and to, I'm not gonna say eliminate, but help um, decrease the amount of uh, forest fires that we see or the spread of forest fires, excuse me, is slash collection and disposal of, bi of biomass. So as those, as those limbs start dying off, as the material falls on the ground, as we are removing trees, as we are going through, what do we do with that product? Do we just chip it up and just leave it, leave it on site? Some people do. Some people bury it. Some people will burn it. There's different ways to get rid of it. One is that you can just pile it up and you can burn it, not in bodies. Second, there's, you, can, you can take it to a location and have it processed as far as biomass and dispose of. The option that, man, I wish this was working. <laughs> the, the option that, that is being proposed here and um, it goes, there we go, we have an IT master helping this out now. Is this. Came up with a, 
an, an alternative, a, a solution we hope that is budget neutral. And that's one key item that I want to, to keep saying time and time again. As our budget at the county is, is, is very tight, we keep spending down our rainy day fund. I wanted to make sure that any option that is presented here is cost effective. Oh, you know. There you go. You get rid of all the. I did it. <laughs>
the initial proposal we had said 40 collection sites. I want to put up here 20 or 40 collection <laughs> sites. And I just want to modify that slide real quick because I feel it's very important that we have multiple collection sites throughout Jefferson County that it is very efficient but also convenient for the users of uh, dropping off the material. That you're not having to drive halfway across the county to drop off a truckload of material. Um, helping mitigate wildlife wildfire concerns is paramount, is number one. And the benefits, 100% complete organic compost that can be used. And also, I was just talking to the chief about this, the design process um, here is, is twofold. One is to help mitigate wildfire concerns, but also uh, to provide a fundraiser activity uh, for different fire protection districts within Jefferson County, in which we have numerous uh, fire protection districts, such that we cover the base cost. So the tipping, they call it tipping fees, so the drop-off fee may be $10. And that would cover the overall cost of driving the material and taking it to the compost site. Okay, there would be an opportunity working with fire protection districts, whether it be uh, Elk Creek, uh, West Meadow, I mean, um, West Metro, or other, sorry, I live in West Meadows, so that's the district. district. Um, but to provide them with an opportunity to sell the, the coupons for a, a specific date. Say on a Saturday from 9 until 10, you have a slot, you get in, you drop off your material, and that may be sold for $15, $20. There's a fundraising opportunity for them to help augment their uh, overall uh, budget. But then there's also fundraising opportunities for, say, the Chamber of Commerce, for others that wish to do that. Uh, but that, that, can, you know, that can be mixed in with Thank you. Um, with the process. So the next steps are uh, approval for the Board of County Commissioners. I already received, uh, I brought this uh, to them a couple weeks ago, uh, more than a couple weeks, about a month ago, and uh, they're excited about the process to move forward, so this is what we're doing, so we're moving forward. I'm getting out there and talking to individuals and seeing um, who would be interested in this process, public and private. We uh, secure our first health uh, project manager. We actually have a proposal uh, for that right now. We're going through that proposal um, in, the, in the contracting phase. So we're moving forward in that regard. Grant applications we have until uh, January, excuse me, June of next year uh, to, to receive those grant applications for the Department of Natural Resources. And securing locations, starting off with 20, building it up to 40. Uh, maybe even more. This is a very scalable type of uh, opportunity. And then uh, coordinating with the local fire protection district schools and others for those drop-off locations. The key here is the drop-off locations. If they're free of charge, much better with the economy. It saves all of us in drop-off and tipping fees. And then also working with volunteers that are out there, whether it be fire protection districts, the chamber, or others to provide um, some labor when the, when the drop off occurs. My time is up, so I thank you very much. If you have any questions, I have business cards up here. I'll hang out for a while. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, uh, and I'd be happy to talk to you more. Thank you. Sheriff's Office, 
Um, so I have been doing forestry and wildland fire for 12 years. So um, basically, my initial attack experience, what allows me to somewhat be qualified to talk about this, I guess, is that I ran an initial attack, hell attack group for the state of Wyoming for four years, and the new wildland fire for 12. So basically, when you look, when I try to talk about initial attack, um, you got to attack the fire initially, right? So that's pretty much what it comes down to. I can't really speak on initial attack for structure fires. It's not a structure fire. Um, so what I can speak to is what I know about wildland fire and that, especially here in the front range, I've been doing a lot of, a lot of studying on some of our front range ecosystems and how they're so fire adapted and we've kind of fallen away from what used to be a natural low intensity fire occurrence that has cleaned the forest floor. We've actually got lots of heavy fuels now intermingled with wildland urban interface. It's just a scenario that's very difficult for a lot of us that live up here to, to think about. So knowing what I know about initial attack, knowing your local area is huge for the responders and those reporting the fires, of course. Having proper strategies and tactics, basically if your strategy is, okay, am I going to do indirect, which is I'm going to burn off a road and let the fire come to the road, something like that, that might be indirect. Direct line is uh, another tactic which is most commonly used in the initial attack, which is hand tools and water on the fire, put the wet stuff on the red stuff. So that's, that's your, those are your strategies, initial attack and, or I mean, uh, indirect and direct attack, and then you have your strategies. Uh, sorry, I'm starting to get those a little confused. But you, you basically have, okay, are you going to use hand tools, you can use engines, you can use a combination of those, aircraft, those, those, are, those are your tactics. So the strategies are indirect or direct. Um, so from there, you know, basically when the responders show up, you know, they're, they're doing the scene size up and, and, and making sure you know, that they can engage this. And they're thinking of three primary or four primary things, which we term in the wildland community as LCES. It's an acronym for lookouts, communications, escape routes, and safety zones. Basically, when you have good communications, you're looking out at one another, and you're looking out the fire, you have a way to get folks out, get yourself out, and you have a safe place to go, that basically allows you to start engaging and putting that fire out. So a lot of that can all happen with that. So basically, that's the initial attack in a nutshell. And from there, you're just constantly feeding everybody that needs to know information, the information that they need to know so you can get more and more responders in to be able to handle the situation as it's progressing or as it's being contained. So that, that for me, as initial attack, is vital that you have the right personnel that's properly trained and basically that has the right equipment and they're trained on that equipment and, and, and then you have depth there to where if they're not available then you can bring somebody in that is able to fill that role. So a lot of times that means getting a command structure set up, we call it ICS, Incident Command Structure or Systems, where at the helm is the incident commander. For initial attack, it's usually you know, the first arriving person. And so the next arriving person that has a higher qualification takes over that, that incident command. And then they can put that next person right into a training position or however it works. But it, it allows there to be growth with plans, a big part of its operations, the logistics, what they need, and then you have, you know, maybe the finance person. But that usually comes later after initial attack. So basically, how are we figuring out a plan based on you know, our objectives and our operations? And then, okay, what do we need to make this all go down? What are our logistical concerns? So I really only have four minutes. I don't know how much time I have, but I can sit up here all day long and talk fire initial attack because I love it. And it's great because it's 
most gratifying part of my job because getting out there and catching it and it doesn't turn into a wind-driven fire event that is just going to move incredibly rapidly like some of the progression maps that we saw earlier with some of the fires here in the front range where at that point it's a very much defensive mode where you know we're getting folks out of the way and we're trying to work on the flanks where you can actually do something because I can tell you right now no person in this entire earth can withstand some of the heat that's coming off of the head of a fire front range wind driven fire event just you will not survive it's just that simple you need to allow that thing to, to, to go and you need to get out of the way and by using some aircraft and slowing it down and so forth there are some ways to, to handle it with initial attack where hopefully you can use some other indirect tactics to get out in front of it to be able to corral it but um, it's, it's very complex in nature if you don't get on it Ball, and when it's you can it really. So that's 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 really you know my little two cent spiel for you guys on initial attack. It's, it's such a vital component of fighting fire in the front range. And anyway, really, um, you know, I had the luxury of going to fires in Wyoming that maybe a hundred acres and they were initial attack fires. I could be there for three, four days and all the birds is somewhere near somebody's fence. So that, that was it. You know, maybe some cattle, maybe some sheep. Here it is much different. You have a 10 acre fire, you can have a hundred homes. So it's just it's just that much more complex in nature and having good eyes out there really helps with that because the reporting comes in rapidly from all of you. And then the responders Volunteer departments really rely on being able to get the proper training and the quick response, with the right apparatus, and have some depth in their people to be able to really handle all scenarios that are within their area. So um, I'm just one component of, of all of this. Um, and so hopefully I can provide some services to, to the county at large. But, I'm not in charge of the district, so you know, I'm, I'm there to assist uh, uh, the, the sheriff's office and the county commissioners and, and, and kind of you know, bring everybody you know, I'm basically that, that liaison and with my helicopter experience, they usually pull me right into a, a helicopter manager role during the fire and course, of course and I have a lot of experience with the air tankers too, so um, you know, knowing what we need fire event um, as it progresses is, is where I usually fit in that, that initial attack period. And then ordering, you know, it's an management team. We have Jeff Cohen as an management team. And then there's other federal teams. So thanks, pal. I'm, I'm pretty much done. So, <laughs> yeah. so I think we're taking questions after that. Yep, okay. absolutely. Thank you so uh, much. Nice to meet all of you guys. Speak in the microphone for the oh, video and also us folks in back. Thank you.
favor or against the mill levy uh, as an official. So I'm going to try to just stick to what uh, you know, what uh, the history is, why the decision was made to go for the mill levy, and uh, what we expect the outcomes to be. So to start with, uh, the fire district does not get any funding, uh, direct funding from the state or federal government, uh, except in the uh, case of getting grants. Uh, and uh, grants you can see actually represent a relatively small amount of the funding uh, for the fire district. Uh, donations also represent a very small uh, portion of the uh, fire district's funding. The primary source of funding for the fire district uh, and for all the fire districts uh, in the state is uh, property tax. Uh, about 75% of, of the funding comes from uh, direct fire district property taxes. And then uh, the next biggest uh, chunk of our funding uh, comes from ambulance revenues. Essentially, the um, money that we get for providing transports of people uh, to uh, the local hospitals. So kind of the history of it, uh, Elk Creek Fire was uh, formed in 1948, uh, and they had a taxing authority uh, initially at that time. I don't know what the taxing history between 1948 and 1972 is. We don't, uh, we don't have much of the records in that time period. We do know that as of 1972, the mill levy was five mills, and uh, currently the mill levy is 4.9 mills. So at this point, we know that uh, the fire district has been operating at that mill rate for at least the last uh, 41 years. So a mill is a little bit confusing, um, primarily because the, there's a couple steps that go into this. So what happens is the state sets the assessment rate on different types of properties. Residential properties, they take the, what they call the actual value, which is what they think you can sell your property at, and then they multiply that by 7.96% to get what they call the assessed value, and then they apply the mill rate, which is you know, one mill is one tenth of a percent. They times that four times the, uh, the assessed value. So essentially, one mill is equal to 0.00079% of the sales, estimated sale price of your uh, residential property. Commercial properties and vacant land are both uh, assessed at a higher rate. Uh, they're assessed at 29% of the estimated actual value. And again, that's not something the fire district has any uh, control over. That is something that is established by the state and then the assessment is done at the county level. So if we look at uh, the current uh, residential uh, mill rates, or the mill rates rather for uh, you know, Jefferson and Park County, uh, right now Elk Creek is at 4.91 mills. Um, and you know, to translate that, that means that if you have a $300,000 house, you pay $117 a year uh, in fire protection. Okay, and that is the lowest rate in either Jefferson or Park County. Um, over the past several years, uh, basically what happened, in case you guys missed it, 2008, we had this little housing crisis, right? And housing values dropped um, fairly dramatically. And as a result, uh, you know, property assessments dropped. And with assessments dropping, so did the amount of uh, funding available to the fire district. So, um, you know, the fire district in 2010 was authorized to collect about $1.16 million. Um, going into 2014, that's going to be um, about $990,000 that is authorized. Unfortunately, the fire district right now is only collecting about 96% of the tax that's owed. So uh, there's quite a bit of, you know, there are, like, there are dead beats, you know, that basically that for one reason or another are not paying for their property taxes. That may be properties that are foreclosed, properties that are vacant, or for whatever 
whatever reason, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, not uh, uh, contributing that, that uh, funding. Ambulance revenues, once again, is our second biggest uh, source of revenue. Uh, but over the same time period, what we've seen is even though our call volume is continuing to increase, uh, first off, we're, we're seeing more people that are choosing to call an ambulance, uh, receive treatment at, at their house or wherever they are, and then they decline uh, you know, an ambulance ride, which they have every right to do. Uh, but the fire district does not receive any revenue for any service other than transporting to the hospital. So if a person calls, they get treatment, we leave them at home, there's no bill to them. Uh, that has in impacted our uh, funding as well. Uh, likewise, uh, we both have more people moving into uh, Medicare age, which is, uh, Medicare doesn't pay us the whole cost of the ambulance uh, transport. They pay us you know, what they have set as their uh, percentage, which is um, you know, lower than, than uh, uh, standard uh, private insurance would pay. So with more people moving on to Medicaid, that is impacted that. Likewise, um, you know, Medicaid rates, reimbursement rates for ambulance uh, services have dropped. And uh, finally, you know, we've seen a lower collection rate for those people who are, uh, you know, who are getting those uh, ambulance uh, rides. So over time, that's impacted our uh, budget pretty significantly. Combined between those two uh, factors, uh, basically, uh, we've cut about 26% out of the budget of the fire district uh, over you know, from the, the past uh, uh, four years. But we did that by cutting uh, our training officer position, cutting our fire marshal position, and cutting the half-time uh, secretarial uh, position. We've uh, cut benefits uh, for the remaining staff that we have. Uh, we've been paring down some of the vehicles uh, we've basically cut into some of the services that we've been providing, and uh, we've also used uh, money out of reserves uh, over the past several years. Going into 2014, we have uh, the assessments that have been provided by the county, and we have another 4% cut uh, to make in services going into next year. Uh, that tax assessments are done every other year, so the tax assessment that is based on property values as of June of this year is what's going to be used for both 2014 and 2015. So we've got those two years to, uh, to write it out. Uh, we did ask the assessor, you know, what is the prognosis for 2016? Because there have been a lot of talk about, well, you know, things are going to bounce back. Uh, the assessor basically said, if the current trends continue through June 30th of 2014, countywide values will increase and residential property values will make a big jump. He made that statement uh, several months back. As of yesterday, uh, he may have provided a clarification to us. The market has not continued to increase at year to rates. It's sort of leveled out. And that's something that we were fortunate to see. Now, if any of you are able to predict where housing prices are going to be uh, come uh, 2015, uh, you know, I'd like to see you after this. Uh, you know, I, I want to know where to put my money. Uh, you know, we really don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, we, can, we can estimate, we can you know, hope that uh, you know, the housing market turns around finally. Uh, it, cert it certainly seemed like it was starting to, but again, you know, we moved into really a, a kind of a stall pattern. And uh, unfortunately, we've actually seen building permits in Conifer are actually less than they were in the last two years. Uh, they have continued to drop off, and uh, that's not really a good sign if you're relying on property values uh, to provide funding for uh, services. Now, this uh, issue is compounded by a problem that we've got. That is that next year you're scheduled to be re-rated by the insurance services organization. Uh, the, the insurance or service organization, ISO, provides information to all of the insurance companies 
that do business in Colorado. Now, most of those insurance companies use that rating number directly. Not all of them do. So, uh, notably, State Farm and all state insurance uh, will, you know, they, they use their own system for how they determine what your insurance rates are going to be. But they do get the information about the fire department capabilities from the ISO, and that is one of the factors they use in you know, determining what they're going to be setting their rates at. Um, I believe that some uh, Jennifer and is going to speak a little bit more about uh, the insurance situation uh, after this. Uh, I'll just bring, you know, kind of describe essentially what ISO is and how that uh, kind of is used and, and impacts uh, the community. ISO ratings go from 1, which is great fire department, to 10, which means that you have no fire department. So your fire insurance rate is going to be determined if the company uses ISO by where you sit on that, that rating. Uh, currently, Elk Creek is a 5 for areas up to 5 miles from the fire station and a 10 for anything in the gas line. So if you live more than 10, 5 miles from the fire station, you don't get any credit. You pay the highest possible rates. Now, that said, there are some other things that are going on that we're hoping will uh, we'll take care of that. The largest area in the district that is uh, class 10 is the Shadow Mountain area. And uh, you know, the thing about that is that Evergreen Fire Station 8 could actually cover that area. Uh, ISO will not recognize uh, the Evergreen Fire Station as a responding station in the Elk Creek District unless uh, they, are, they are dispatching the automatic gate. Uh, we are currently working with Evergreen Fire. We've been working with them for quite a while. Uh, and the big factor that we've got there is in order to have that happen, we're going to probably have to move over to having Evergreen Fires provide our dispatch services instead of them coming out of the um, sheriff's office. Uh, that will save a lot of people a lot of money. Uh, but we have to figure and factor it in the budget that it's going to cost about $34,000 a year more uh, than the free service that we're currently getting. Uh, so it's kind of a, it's a trade-off. We're going to try to provide that uh, service and the amount of savings that those people in that area would get would be uh, pretty phenomenal. We've got a number of deficiencies that we know of going into the uh, grading next year. Uh, the biggest ones being the older apparatus. Those old apparatus uh, may or may not be uh, you know, considered at all as part of the uh, fire protection that's provided uh, to the district. There will, they basically go on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, anything that's up to 20 years old, you know, they, they assume that it's in good condition. Anything over 20 years old, they are going to want to actually determine whether or not it meets the minimum qualifications. Unfortunately, all three of those stopped passing their pumping tests quite a few years ago. So right off the bat, we know that unless we, you know, dropped quite a bit of money in each of them, to replace those pumps, they're not going to uh, pass and they're not going to be usable. It's a tough situation to look at dropping tens of thousands of dollars in a 25 year old truck. Uh, you know, it's still an old truck, it's still an old engine, and frankly, the tankers, uh, you know, the, the uphill speed, uh, you know, we park one of them up in Conifer Mountain at the top uh, because it can go downhill. Uh, it takes about 45 minutes to drive it from the bottom of King Valley back up to the top. Uh, so it, uh, its speed uphill is about seven miles an hour. We also are going to, we've got a problem that we don't have a reserve engine, uh, and then we've also got, uh, you know, both the, the cuts in uh, the training officer, the cut in the, the fire marshal's position, are going to hurt the rating as well. So we've got a number of, of factors that are going against us going into the the ISO rating. The biggest factor that we have to look at there is the tanker credit. Uh, because if I ask all of you, how many of you live within a thousand feet of a 
standard fire hydrant, I'm going to guess that only the people that live in Kings Valley are going to raise their hands uh, because that's the only part of the community that you know residential uh, properties are within a thousand feet of the fire hydrant. Uh, that means that the majority of the people in the district are getting that class five rating based on what's called the tanker credit, which is that we have to be able to deliver 30,000 gallons of water in under two hours anywhere in the district. And the 30,000 gallons is the absolute minimum. They can ask for more than that, and they determine the amount that they are going to require based on what they expect we would need for a particular house fire or a particular commercial structure fire in a particular area. So basically, if you are more than seven minutes from the water source, then it takes a minimum of four tankers uh, to meet that, four 3,000 gallon tankers. Right now, we have two really good tankers and two really old tankers, uh, which may not uh, receive that, that credit. And obviously, their turnaround time is not going to be uh, sufficient that we would be able to make this standard. So with our current equipment, we would not pass. So again, you know, passing the tanker show was unlikely. That would mean that anybody who's outside a thousand feet from the hydrant would automatically go from class five to class eight. And that's that's the. Uh, the minimum level they'll give you without uh, the water credit. So, um, you know, the board, after looking at the financial situation and uh, the potential impacts to the community, uh, you know, spent the first half of this year looking at uh, you know, what would be uh, you know, a way that uh, financially this uh, could be resolved. And again, currently we're at 4.9 mils. Uh, they are proposing a 2.5 mil increase for a 10 year period. Uh, and that would bring the mill levy to 7.4 mils. That uh, mill is a sunset mill. That means it's in the language of the law that when, you know, when the 10 years are up, we no longer have the uh, ability to, to collect that uh, tax increase. Once again, you know, we were at uh, the lowest tax level in uh, the uh, in either Jefferson or Park County currently. Uh, and after uh, the proposed mill level the levy, the fire district would still be the least expensive fire and EMS protection in either Jefferson or Park County. <coughs> so what, what does that translate to? Uh, that uh, 2.9 mil increase works out to $59.70 for a 300000 dollars home. Or for a $400,000 home, that's $79.60, or $6.63 a month. Um, one of the things that was considered was a bond. And one advantage to a bond is that when you get a bond, it would, uh, it would be very direct that the bond would be used for uh, replacing that equipment that's required. The downsides, unfortunately, are that uh, you know, when we looked into that, uh, the first $60,000 or more of the bond would go to pay for the bond council, legal fees, regulatory fees, and the underwriting fees. So essentially, right off the bat, you know, we'd be paying money to you know, legal, uh, to lawyers, instead of putting that money into uh, direct means uh, for the district. So the other option is that a levy increase, which then is turned into a lease purchase, you get the same basic uh, uh, benefits, which is that it's tax exempt uh, financing, which means that it's a very low interest rate, same interest rate that a bond would get, but uh, they're very comparable to the interest rate, but does not come with the additional fees up front. The money for this bond would be used for some very specific things that we've identified. To start with, uh, out of the uh, out of the uh, you know positions that we have to cut, we would be restoring one position, and that position would be responsible for doing basically what two people were doing before. Uh, we would uh, 
put essentially $233,000 a year into the apparatus replacement. Uh, and that's going to be something the, the board is going to be discussing more at their upcoming meetings about specifically how that's going to function, whether that's going to be initially one lease purchase and that money going into reserves, or whether all of that money will go into a, an upfront lease purchase program. Um, the first year, we we're looking at putting $75,000 into uh, protective gear for volunteers. And the primary reason for that is that we want to essentially increase the number of volunteers we have and we want to buy the equipment that, that they need to get started. You know, we pretty much depleted our, our personal protective gear, the turnout gear for the firefighters, with our existing volunteers. We have increased the volunteers over the last few years really at the capacity of what we can take right now. But we're also increasing in call volume. Uh, we're going to probably get really close to uh, 1,200 calls into this year, uh, which is an increase of uh, 60 to 80 calls over last year at the current rate. And uh, you know, we'd like to have more volunteers to kind of spread the work that we have to come in. What, uh, the other money that uh, we're looking at providing there, one of the things is that our volunteers not only don't get paid at all, they don't even get the $5 for a call that many volunteers get, but we actually ask them to pay for their own EMT training and buy some of their own gear. We'd like to actually start providing that training to the volunteers so that they're not paying money out of their pocket to come here and serve the community. And then finally, what you know, what we have left after the plan would uh, go into reserves. This is actually a relatively small amount that's going to be available from that funding initially. But uh, you know, over the next couple of years, as we pay off a couple of the old leases, we anticipate that we'd be able to start building up uh, those reserves a little bit more. Right now, the district is at the pretty much at the minimum of what is really acceptable to keep in reserves between the required deeper amounts, the uh, money that it takes to keep the district going from January 1st until tax revenue comes in, and you know, a small cushion to pay for major incidents. That cushion, you know, the board has set at $100,000 to give you an idea, talking again about the initial attack response, the little Bluebell fire, the 14 acre fire over there in Gold Forest, uh, that costs about eighty-five thousand dollars to fight that fire. So uh, you know, keeping a hundred thousand dollars, you know, for emergencies is really kind of keeping it at the very bottom of what uh, is really true. The position that we're talking about replacing again would be half the fire marshal job, half the training officer job, and their primary goal, their primary duties would be to recruit and train. Of volunteers, train the existing volunteers, manage the fire prevention programs, and support both mitigation and uh, grant writing for the district. Both of those positions are required positions under that ISO rating. So getting one person in to do those will actually help bump that rating back up again. There are no plans to add any other staffing uh, from this uh, uh, increase. And over the next three years, uh, there will be no permanent staff. I'm going to say permanent because we do use uh, you know, temporary employees to fill in uh, what, we, what we call part-time employees to fill in if we don't have paramedics available. Uh, and obviously, we would still continue to try, to try to do that as much as possible. So for the next three years, you know, the staffing level is going to be the uh, basically the 10 positions that we're talking about. Uh, and Following that, after three years out, you know, any additional staffing will really be based on community needs. So essentially what we're talking about is that, you know, compared to 2010, we're still going to be at a smaller career staffing, down from 12 and a half to 10 positions, uh, but we're looking to increase uh, to 75 volunteers is our, our goal uh, with this program. And uh, again, we think that that's a really sustainable uh, volunteer uh, force for the district. Okay, on, on the apparatus side, once again, you know, we've got issues with the aging apparatus. We've been putting 
them off, replaced them for a number of years, even before uh, you know uh, the uh, housing crisis happened. The district already had started to recognize the issues with the aging uh, apparatus. And fire engines are really expensive, uh, unfortunately. They, uh, you know, a typical cost for a structure engine is five hundred fifty thousand dollars. A brush truck can be as much as two hundred thousand. And uh, you know, unfortunately, they keep going up every year. When I've asked for you know prices from different manufacturers to be able to plug in for planning, every time I talk to them, they give me a, a higher number, and they say you better order it before the first of the year. Uh, so um, I don't know. I, you know, it, it's gotten it's gotten really you know, more and more expensive over time. So what we're looking at is that you know we got we started to have 25 pieces of equipment when I started with the district. We want to reduce that by making uh, the firefighting fleet more efficient. And uh, one of those is that we're going to uh, look at replacing uh, you know, a structure engine and a brush truck with interface type engines. And uh, this will actually be both a cost savings to the district, but it also gives us a number of efficiency, uh, you know, efficiencies that we don't currently have. Uh, on wildland fires, we would have greater capacity of water, we'd have greater uh, pump capacity, we'd uh, have more equipment uh, that are going out there, and we, these trucks are really specifically designed to protect uh, homes when a wildfire threatens them. They came out of California and they've been spreading across the country because they're really a lot more efficient than the old school, uh, you know, flatbed pickup truck with a little tank on the back of it. Uh, on the other side of it, it gets to places that are more, you know, that are difficult for the full-size fire engines to get to. And by, you know, combining these apparatus, we would be reducing two structure engines uh, and a couple of the uh, two of the brush trucks for three of these engines, which means that we have, instead of four total engines to go to a house fire, we have five at a lower cost, and uh, we have one that's a spare. Right now, with four stations and four trucks, if one is uh, in the shop for maintenance, that means that station closes until the, that fire truck is fixed. So this would allow us to keep all of those stations uh, staffed with apparatus. So over the 10, year, uh, 10 years that we're looking at, uh, you know, we are looking at basically reducing that fleet by 25% overall, reducing our annual cost for our vehicles by 25%. The total cost of the firefighting fleet, if we were to try to replace it all today, would be roughly around $5 million. You know, when you start looking at the cost of these apparatus. So by re reducing that, you know, we basically knock off a pretty big chunk of what has to be put into apparatus replacement on an annual basis. We're going to maintain the four stations uh, that we have currently. Uh, while it would be nice to get a couple of stations in these areas that are further away, I don't see that the funding is going to be available to do that in that 10-year uh, that period, unless the community uh, you know, really goes through some pretty dramatic growth. Uh, and then again, the main, the main thing is that we're going to look at really increasing the, the training and increasing the volunteer uh, component of our department of maintaining the current staffing level for the uh, full-time staff. Okay, I'd like to thank you for your time. And uh, again, when the questions come in, I'll try to answer any that uh, you might have.
Is that why our rates are going up? It's not. Unfortunately, in 2011, the insurance industry posted its largest catastrophic loss in history. 2012 was the third most expensive year in history. So we have had back-to-back -back years of horrible losses. Now, I'm not asking you to feel sorry for the insurance companies, but they've been using reserves. Most of our companies are paying out $110 for every $100 bringing in. You ask, you might wonder, how can they save this? It's that way they're using reserves, but they can't continue to do it. So rates have to go up. And all over the country, they're going up. Superstorm Sandy, our wildfires out west, massive hail, tornadoes in the Midwest. It all impacts us. So what I can say is, is approving any kind of a mill levy going to stop your insurance from going up? It's not. But what it will do is at least protect that one portion that makes a big difference on your insurance, which is your fire rating. Insurance companies are now inspecting homes more than they ever used to. They're coming out to see how close the trees are. They're coming out to see the slope of your land. They're coming out to see how close you are to a thick forest area. They're looking at the age of your roof. They're looking at your financial stability. They're looking at all of that. So what I can truly tell you is that if we lose our good fire rating, it will just impact you even more so. And if uh, you have prior claims, it'll be a double whammy. So the bottom line is call your own insurance agent and ask the questions. They, are, they would love to talk to you, and they can give you an idea of what would happen. And also look at where you're located. Uh, because, yeah, Shadow Mountain up on Black Mountain, that is, that is a tough spot up there. And if there has to be a station that closes at the top of Conifer Mountain, those people are going to be in the same, in the same boat going to a PC-10. So anyway, um, I'm going to wrap up because we want to get you guys done. Um, so I'm going to bring up Berkeley from the station, uh, from the Elk Creek Fire Department. He's going to tell you what they've got going on if you want to actually come in and see Elk Creek for yourself. And then we're going to bring, right, sorry, we're going to bring on just, um, if those of you who have questions, we're going to be collecting them. So as Berkeley is speaking, if you guys don't mind just passing down your questions to the end of the aisle here, Melissa will pick them up. So thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Berkeley Guy, assistant guy from both uh, volunteers at Elk Creek. We just wanted to let you guys know we're going to uh, host an open house on October 12th from 11 to 1 a.m. to p.m. Uh, during the middle of the day, we're going to lunch. Um, we're going to basically open the doors to the department and let everybody in, let you see what we have, what we do, um, and, and kind of just let you guys explore everything we're telling you about. All those engines that she talked about, um, the old engines, the new engines, what the differences are, you can see them, you can touch them. Um, and we just want to let everybody in to, to make a decision for themselves and just show you what we have, what we have to offer. We're also going to, uh, like I said, provide lunch and then we're also going to provide training um, and allow you guys to use extinguishers if you want um, and just kind of make it a, a fun experience for everybody. All ages are invited, kids, grandparents, parents, everybody's invited. So we'll see you there. Thank you. 
2012, Elk Creek Fire Department overspent the budget by a significant amount. How much of that overage was in district events versus out of district performance? And why are no budget amendments filed as required by law? Okay, um, the, first, the first part, or the second part of that, I'll answer first. State law in Colorado does not require a budget to be amended. Okay, that's something that has been, uh, you know, tossed around a few times. That is not what Colorado state law says. Uh, basically, uh, the, the uh, district uh, is at their discretion to amend or not amend a budget uh, as needed. As long as they stay within the uh, resolute, the uh, author, the appropriations that were authorized by the board through the appropriate resolution. So uh, on that side of it, the fire district did not have to do a budget amendment. Uh, I know that the district has in the past amended their budget at the end of the year to match what you know actually was done. You know, and, and this actually reminds me a little bit of what Soviet Russia used to do, where they set a quota, and then when they didn't meet the quota, they revised the quota down to what they did meet. Uh, I think it's a lot more transparent for the district to come out and say, you know, this is what we expected, but this is instead what what uh, uh, what things cost us. So there were two uh, main factors in the both the revenues and the expenditures for the district were higher than projected. Uh, the largest part of that was that the district collected $236,000 in reimbursements for providing services outside the district to other districts or other agencies that were having fires. Out of that, um, I believe $115,000 were expenses such as fuel, uh, personnel costs. The rest of that money actually was money that uh, rolled back into uh, our capabilities at no cost to the local taxpayers. So more than $100,000 was rolled into improving our uh, capabilities and it didn't cost you guys anything. Uh, that included purchase of a uh, used brush truck. Uh, that again, 100% of that was paid for by uh, outside activities of the district. Uh, and um, then in addition to that, we also were fortunate that we got uh, donations to pay for a uh, UTV that allows us to access, uh, you know, remote areas where we can't get a brush truck yet. So we, we actually, even though uh, we did not uh, spend money out of, out of local tax coffers, we, we were able to improve our capabilities. The other uh, piece of, the, uh, of that uh, was, unfortunately, we had to pay back $44,000 in grant funds that had been collected on previous grants that uh, were not spent on the uh, grant projects. We had to reimburse that to FEMA. That dated back to grant projects back in, in 2010. So that, uh, even though that was paid back in 2013, it was moved back to the 2012 budget by the auditor, because that's the way they do things. Commissioner Roger, we got a question for you. Another question. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind coming up. Would the Jefferson County compost be available to Park County residents and then as a resident, what can they do to mitigate road right of the easement rush? Is it legal to cut it down? I'll give you this card so you can cheat it if you get the second question. Is it legal to cut it down? Uh, we'll start with the first. Would it be um, open to Park County? Uh, definitely. Uh, if we look if it's convenient to Park County users who, who wish to come and to drop off um, uh, slash, most definitely, because the way I view it is not just this area, only these people are, are able to do it. Fire does not discriminate uh, from county to county, from city to city, from, from area to area. So if there's a way that we can help with it, if there's individuals in Park County who wish to come over and utilize the facility, if there's, if there's capacity there, most definitely, that would be an opportunity. As far as Maybe road right of way uh, as far as brushing it. If it's the Jefferson County Road 
that's, that's right of way maintained by Jefferson County, and there's brush issues, give us a call. Road and bridge should get out there, clean it up, maintain that. Okay, if it is not a county road, then you just need to know who has the easement on that, who owns that road, and then you can go out there and maintain it. But if it's a county road, please tell me, please tell Road and Bridge, and we'll go out, get out there and maintain it. Hey, you're popular. So, um, this is one more, and I'm going to read it. I'm all in favor of compost, but what will be its pH and its acidity? <laughs> Just as a professional. So 
that's, that, that's that because the risk of three lives and uh, all that. Uh, I, can't, I can't speak to the lives of property loss on, on, on escape prescribed murders. That's, that's not my place to, but in general, prescribed fires are great management. We've got a, a couple more questions to get to, and I want to make sure that we're respectful of everyone's time. So if we can pull yep. those questions till after. Um, this one is for Don Rocha, where'd you go? Push your own. I'd like to know the answer to this one, too. It's not a PH uh, question, is it? It's not a PH question. Okay. The question is, basically, um, why is vacant land and commercial land taxed higher than residential land? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, commercial rates uh, for quite some time in Colorado have always been taxed at about 3.7 times higher than residential property. So if you are a commercial owner um, and have commercial property, you pay a, a higher rate, uh, taxable mill levy rate to the county. And uh, why was it set that way? Uh, it goes back with, with the way um, you look at the Colorado Revised Statute, you look at mill levies and, and the stack, uh, statute process. Um, most of what we do, in fact, all of what we do in the county, we are an arm of the state government. So we are bound by the rules of, of CRS, Colorado Revised Statute. So that's one of those uh, statutes that, that we follow as far as the assessments on um, commercial property. The same thing when uh, I had a, a, a question years ago. Um, by an individual of why when I um, develop a piece of ground and I may have 10 parcels of ground and it's an ad zoning, but I sell one of those parcels of ground and now all of a sudden somebody purchases it and say they don't want to build for five years. They pay that same commercial, that elevated tax rate. Once again, as a county, you cannot adjust <coughs> can't adjust that because that's state statute. There is discussion with, um, with our state legislators to try to eliminate that. That is my personal opinion, and I'll share it. That is an, that's an onerous type of uh, taxing structure because it really prevents individuals from purchasing, holding that piece of ground until six times they build. Does that answer all the questions? That, that is that question. Okay, what's the other one? Oh, good. Good luck, Chief. Here you go. Okay, thanks. I know we're running kind of late, and uh, we did want to uh, get out of here on time, especially because I think the school's only given us a certain amount of time that we can be in here. So I'm going to run through uh, some of these really quick. I'm uh, going to apologize if we don't get to every question here. Uh, Lime Gulch Fire. Why was it left to burn 18 hours before any emergency attention? Uh, I think that actually would have to be a question that would be asked of the uh, National uh, U.S. Forest Service because uh, the Lime Gulch fire uh, occurred, uh, it was not within the Elk Creek Fire District, it was on uh, National Forest property. I can speak a little bit to that and that is that we had you know, a lightning bust that came through. Uh, we had um, two fires in our district and one that we fought in North Forks District uh, for them. Uh, they responded to at least three other fires all in the same area. And um, at this point, you know, we assume that uh, the Lime Gulch fire started as part of that same thing, but it was frankly one that, uh, you know, didn't, uh, maybe it didn't pop up or uh, it was mistaken for one of the other three fires that were within basically about a, a thousand acre area there, so that that would be my kind of speculation on it. Again, that'd be something I'd say you have to ask uh, ask the U.S. Forest Service if you really wanted any more specific answers. Because again, it was uh, we responded to help with the fire, but uh, we did not have jurisdiction. Uh, what impact will Sloan State Park have on Elk Creek Fire Department, and are there any funds from the state? Uh, we did our first um, rescue of a person who fell from a cliff on Sunday. Uh, that took several hours uh, of uh, volunteers and, and uh, our crew staff to get them out of there. 
uh, we have been running on a call and some on average about every 10 to 12 days. Uh, we expect that to slow down in the summer, but it is adding uh, to our uh, to our workload. Uh, as far as what funds come from the state, no. uh, in the state of Colorado, basically Denver Mountain Parks, uh, Jefferson County Open Space, uh, U.S. Forest Land that's within our district, and Spawn State Park. All of those we're required to protect for no funding. Okay, so and that and that does make a challenge. It adds more workload, uh, but you know, the, I believe the uh, the idea there is that uh, you know we gain the benefit of having those open spaces or those parks. Uh, there is a program I know that, that of those uh, only the open space. Um, uh, lands, they will actually help reimburse us, and in some cases, the Forest Service will if we stay after the first day and continue fighting the fire. Uh, but in the other cases, we pretty much have to continue fighting that fire or providing those rescues at uh, no reimbursement. Okay, uh, given the high cost of equipment, what will $233,000 what, uh, what we're looking at as a plan there, what, and what I'm uh, asking the board to do is actually to finance the purchase of the three uh, interface fire engines and the two uh, tankers. And that $233,000 is the estimated payment on the financing for those each year. So essentially that will buy us you know, all of the equipment that we need for about next four years, except for uh, probably we've got uh, one ambulance that will be up uh, to be replaced in that time frame. But that will cover that time frame. That 233000 is for the 10-year life of the uh, no levy that we're asking for. Again, the, the final details of that will uh, be worked out in the board in the budget process, but that is the proposal. Okay, this one's fairly long, so I'm going to kind of summarize. According to the uh, reports, uh, we've been averaging 45 shift days covered by volunteers each month. And why not capitalize on those hours to cover one of the two annual shifts each day, saving the district hundreds of thousands of dollars? Well, to start with, uh, the total amount that we're going to be paying for the full-time, uh, you know, the, the one firefighter EMT and the one firefighter paramedic, uh, to cover for the entire year is about 300,000. So I don't think that you know getting volunteers to cover some of that is going to save us two thirds of it. We do, in fact, use volunteers uh, to support the staff, you know, and to fill in. They very often take ambulance calls. They often uh, take shifts that when uh, one of the uh, paid firefighters is off duty, uh, but. One of the things to recognize is because we have not been paying for them to go to EMT training, a large percentage of them are not EMTs, which means that they're not qualified to provide patient care in ambulance. Uh, we've got a small number of uh, volunteer paramedics, uh, and most of those are willing to come out, help on a call, but they, you know, they don't want to take the transport time. The thing you realize here is that. Every time we transport a patient, it's somewhere between two and three hours uh, between the time they go to the call, drive all the way down to, to Lakewood or Englewood, drop the patient off, turn around and come back up here. So a lot of our volunteers are willing to come out and help out on the calls. They don't want to put in, you know, two or three hours at a time, three or four times a day to do that. Well, we, when we have uh, volunteers shifting, they do uh, help out with that. They do, uh, uh, in fact, uh, some of our guys back there are uh, uh, wearing their turnout gear because they just came back from taking a uh, patient down to, uh, to the hospital right before the meeting. So we are doing that, and that is one of the reasons that we are able to keep the cost of fire protection here so much lower than in most places. Personnel. 
can get out there with a person and they can just look at it. So if they don't have equipment to fight it, that's pretty much part of the, that's the equation there. I mean, you're not going to put a fire out with just some people. I mean, you can kind of kick some dirt, I guess, but I mean, it comes from everything from tools to have proper hand tools to have the engine to drive you there, from the water that squirts to the radio that you use to talk to the aircraft and dispatch, I mean, everything is vital. Thank you.